Hi, I'm Ken, and I'm going to be walking through our HTST system here at the CIT. And I'm going to be going through all the components of our HTST and following the flow of raw milk through our system until we have it pasteurized. So the first component in the system is our refrigerated holding tank. So this is a double-walled insulated tank that's designed to hold, hold the raw milk at below 40 degrees Celsius. In the industry, you'd be working with really large silos. But here we have a small sized system. So this is our refrigerated holding tank to keep our temperatures below four of the raw milk. So the milk then travels from the refrigerated holding tank into, into our constant level tank. So the constant level tank here is basically designed, as the name implies, to keep a constant level of milk in the system and feeding the system. So inside we have a float system, which basically it's very similar to what you would have with your toilet at home. If you ever lift up the cover on your tank, you'll see just a simple float system that will keep that water in your toilet, or in this case the raw milk, in the constant level tank at a nice consistent level. So from the constant level tank, the milk then flows through the pipe to our booster pump, which is over here. So our booster pump, basically there are two exits for the raw milk. So we have a bypass valve here, which when we're starting up, we have no pressures or temperatures or anything in our plates or plate heat exchanger. So initially we have to utilize the bypass and then the milk is going to be fed in and it's going to start heating up and regulating the pressures and the milk will be going into a divert back to the constant holding tank and then it'll be fed through again. I'll talk about that a little bit later. So once we have our plate heat exchanger all functioning correctly, what we have then is milk flows up this pipe here. Okay, so our milk now is going into our plate heat exchanger. So we're going to see that there's a number of controllers and sensors that are going to be taking temperatures and pressures throughout the system. So the first sensor here is measuring our pressure going in or our raw pressure. And I'm going to be talking about that a little bit later. So the raw milk is coming in and the first section that is going to be going in is what's known as a regeneration section of our plate heat, heat exchanger. So this is where we have the biggest number of plates in the system and where you usually get about 90% efficiencies. In essence, we're utilizing the coolness of the raw milk to actually cool down the pasteurized milk. And the pasteurized milk that is warm is transferring some of that heat to warm up the incoming cool raw milk. So it's basically taking advantage of the thermal efficiencies there. And so the regeneration section is where you get the most efficiency. So our milk that is cold is flowing towards the back and is being gradually warmed up from the pasteurized milk. So then it comes out of the regeneration section here and the milk flows down. And the next piece of equipment that we see here is what's known as a timing pump. So from the timing pump, our milk is flowing, and our next device that we encounter is a flow meter. So as the name implies, it just simply measures the flow rate of the raw milk. So coming out of the flow meter, what happens is now it's going to go into our heating section of the plate heat exchanger. So we utilize warm water in this portion of the heat exchanger. So we have steam 
that we utilize here, which goes through a steam valve, and the steam valve then injects steam into our cold water, bringing up the temperature so it's efficient for our final stage of heating in the plate heat exchanger. So our milk that's still raw is being heated up to the final temperature that's required. Okay, so we are looking now at our temperature controllers here. So we have our controller here where we have the ability to set our process parameters. So we can set here, you'll see as I adjust this, I have the ability to adjust the temperature. So whatever the appropriate temperature that is required, we adjust it here, and that adjusts our target temperature. When the system's actually running, you will notice that we actually record the temperature as well. So this needle here will travel up and it will meet our target temperature and the circular chart turns, albeit at a very slow rate, and it's a permanent record monitoring the temperature of the milk. So this is a permanent time record that would be part of your house plan or CCP specifically. So that's how we set the temperature. Now I talked about the water temperature Obviously, we need our water temperature above our pasteurization temperature, and that's from the steam valve here. And so we have another controller here that is measuring the water temperature. So our set's 175. It's showing 75 right now because the system's not running. So if the system was running, we'd see what our actual hot water temperature would be displayed on this device over here. So getting back over to where we were over here, we have our milk now that has been brought up to pasteurization temperatures and it is coming out of the plate heat exchanger and is flowing up this tube here, which is known as the holding tube. So this holding tube here, you'll see is sloped upwards and it is a particular length. So this is something that's engineered. So based on the flow rate, based on the length of the holding tube and based on the diameter of the pipe, all that's engineered. So we have and are able to achieve the lethality that we require for our pasteurized milk. So, Typically, you're looking for a minimum of 16 seconds. It could be 17 or even up to 18 seconds. So these are the parameters that are accounted for with the length of this upward sloping holding tube. So coming out of the holding tube, we are going to now pass through two sensors. The first sensor is an indicating thermometer which is recording the temperature, the legal temperature of the pasteurized milk. And the second sensor is recording the temperature for the recording chart. Now I want to talk about the importance of pressure. We need to ensure that the pasteurized milk is at least 2 PSI above the raw milk. So we want to make sure that if there is any leaks or pinholes in our plates that we would never allow the raw milk to get mixed with the pasteurized milk. So maintaining that pressure differential of at least 2 PSI allows us to be confident that we have pasteurized milk and pasteurized milk only, not mixed with raw milk. So it's important to monitor both temperature and pressure. So now I want to show you, we actually are monitoring the pressures here. So we have our raw pressure and our pasteurized pressure. Again, we're looking for a minimum of 2 PSI differential with the pressurized pasteurized milk 
at a higher pressure than the raw milk. This display right now is showing zero because your system's not operating. So, if there is a problem with either the pressure or the temperature, that will be detected by our next two set of devices here. So these are the flow diversion valves. So the first diversion valve here measures or activates upon any faults with temperature or pressure, which were just sensed earlier. So if there is not enough of a pressure differential, the minimum two PSI, this melt will be diverted back through to a constant level tank. And then it will be going back through the plate heat exchanger. So if our pressure is not adequate enough, the differential, it's going to be repasteurized again. Similarly, if our temperature requirement, which will be displayed here, and also will be displayed on our chart recorder here, and you'll see right now that there's two colors here. So green would be indicating forward flow, meaning that the temperature is appropriate, and red would mean that it's not meeting the conditions. And it's not meeting the conditions, where is the melt going? The melt is going back into our constant level tank. So pressure or temperature, if they don't meet specifications, back to be repasteurized. So if temperature and pressure are okay, it travels to our next flow diversion valve. So this is what's known as a leak detector. So if there's any melt that escapes past this here, for whatever reason, maybe there's a leak in the O-ring, because periodic maintenance needs to occur, so if there was a leak here, and there was a little bit of melt that wasn't adequately pasteurized, that slipped past the valve here, it would be picked up and detected by the second valve, which is the leak detection valve, and you will see that there is a sight glass here. So this is just a clear piece of glass, which would enable the operator to see if there's any melt flowing through because then maintenance can be contacted because then clearly we know our valve needs servicing. So once again, if there's melt here that's getting passed, it goes back into our constant level tank and it's gonna go back through the process. So if pressure and temperature are okay, there's no leaks in the system. What happens is our finished pasteurized milk is now exiting the pipe and is going back into our plate heat exchanger. And so this is where I talked about this earlier. We are utilizing the warmth of the finished product to be able to transfer that heat to the incoming raw milk. So it's basically going into the regeneration section. So the milk now is traveling this way. So it is being slowly cooled down, albeit heating up the raw incoming milk at the same time. So it's counter flow, we're going in different directions. So once it finishes going through the regeneration section, it's still not quite cool enough, so it needs to go through the third section, which is the cooling section. But first we measure the pressure of the pasteurized milk as it exits the regeneration section, just before the cooling section. And we use city water, so we have a cold water supply here coming in that's potable water. It's chlorinated, and so we're able to monitor the temperature of our incoming cold water here. So this cold water is being fed in and this is the cooling section. So to summarize, there are three parts of the plate heat exchanger. The regeneration section, where the bulk of the activity happens and the efficiencies. And then we also have a heating section and the cooling section. So once the melt comes out of the cooling section, 
we're going to be recording what the temperature is of our finished milk here. So we're looking at temperatures below 4 degrees Celsius. And so then it's traveling up this vertical pipe here and it goes to our vacuum brake. And so this vacuum brake is basically similar to a fail-safe device. So if there is a power failure or if there's a problem with the downstream filling equipment, the vacuum breaker will maintain a positive pressure in the system. Since it's at least 12 inches above the highest raw point of the milk, what happens is due to gravity, the pasteurized milk will push down as it drains and maintain that positive pressure against the raw milk in the regeneration section. So then it goes to the filling equipment. Now one other thing I'd like to mention is, notice our constant level tank here. This is physically located below where the action's occurring. So if there was a problem, like again, if there's a power failure or something like that, we want our raw, unpasteurized milk to be draining back into this constant level tank. The system is basically designed so that we have no raw milk, no matter the circumstances, whether it's a power failure or equipment failures, that would ever get into the pasteurized milk. That's why it's important that we keep our pressure differentials and we make sure that we have our temperatures. So the final piece of our system here is our CIP system. So this is a separate clean in place or CIP system which has its own pumps. And so this is where we can run our caustic type of solutions through the system at the end of the shift. So I'm not gonna cover that in any detail, but I just wanted to point that out.